Hello, everyone, and welcome to this CSSJ uh, webinar on voter suppression. My name is uh, Tony Bolts. I'd just like to begin by uh, thanking the, uh, the media services for organizing this uh, webinar behind the scenes, um, the CSSJ staff, uh, particularly Catherine, who worked on this, and also to really to, to thank all the panelists for joining us uh, this afternoon. The title of this webinar, as I said, is uh, Voter Suppression. The right to vote, that is uh, political equality, was not present at the birth of the American Republic. After the revolution, there was a limited suffrage. Only white men with property were allowed to vote. Uh, speaking in 1776, the, Mr. John Adams uh, made a point that in, in a letter to a colleague, he says, um, depend upon, sir, it is dangerous, Mr. Adams continue, to open so fruitful a source of controversy and altercation as would be opened by attempting to alter the qualification of voters. There will be no end to it. New claims will arise. Women will demand to vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights are not enough attended to. And every man who was not a father, he continues, will demand an equal voice with any other. In all acts of state, it tends to confound and destroy all distinctions and the prostate all ranks to one common level. Of course, at this point in time in 1776, and this, with this dominant political attitude, Africans enslaved, whether they were male or female, as well as the indigenous population, were not considered um, citizens were not considered human even, and therefore were not allowed to have any rights at all uh, of, of being citizens and human beings. This fact of the absence of political equality has meant that the right to vote in America, the right to political equality was only won because of various profound struggles. And as these rights were won through struggle, then there was a real difficulty where every time the, the rights, were, rights were won, there were obstacles that were placed in the, for the implementation and exercising of these rights. So there was, when the rights were won, that sometimes there were property for, uh, qualifications. Then there were literacy tests. Then there were poll taxes, all obstacles, all on the path of the right to vote. For black people, of course, it is about enslavement. And even in the re after the reconstruction, when black men were given, had some kind of limited franchise, this was quickly taken away as the black codes and Jim Crow um, were instituted in the South and then spread uh, northward through segregation. So that the right to vote was therefore a right in this country that was not fully realized and that it has always been accompanied with, the, with voter suppression. So the rights of the franchise, the right to vote is accompanied by always by ways to close it. All this raises for us, of course, very important issues about what sort of democracy do we have? when voter suppression remains part of the mainstream political practice and culture. Today, when there's, a kind of, when there's an authoritarian populist regime in power, when the Supreme Court narrowly ruled yesterday that, to, that vote, male votes in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania may be opened by electoral officials up to three days after the election day, when the very same Supreme Court ruled in 2013, it made a ruling that gutted the sections of the 1964 uh, Voting Act. When in Florida, 
there are rules against felons, so-called ex-felons, not being able to not being able to vote unless they have pay, paid fines. Or when in Harrisburg, Texas, the official polling boxes are now spread out so far from the population that there will be great difficulty. People have great difficulty getting to it. Thus, this issue of voting rights, of political equality, is now one of the central issues of our present time. To discuss this this afternoon and its implications both for America and the upcoming elections, we have um, four remarkable uh, panelists, uh, and I will just introduce them, and they will. They, we have already agreed to a speaking order. Nense Ufut is the chief exec executive officer of the New Georgia Project, and its affiliate New Georgia Project Action Fund. She leads both organizations with a data-informed approach and has a commitment to developing tools that leverage technology with the goal of making it easier for every voter to engage in, in, in every election. She is dedicated, she has dedicated her life and career to working on civil and human and workers' rights issues and leads two organizations whose, com whose complementary aims are to strengthen Georgia's democracies. Under her leadership, the NGP has registered nearly 425,000 Georgians uh, to vote. Then we will then, in, and this is the order that we will have people speaking, uh, Marcia Johnson uh, Blanco, uh, who is a lawyer, co-director of the Lawyers Committee Voting Rights Project, where she manages the project's programmatic and advocacy portfolios, which include in leading election protection, the nation's largest nonpartisan non voter protection program, overseeing the work of the National Commission of Voting Rights. She is the recognized leader in voting rights who has participated in countless voting rights discussions at conferences and in the media, she, is also co she also coordinates the Lawyers Committee's uh, International Human Rights Initiative. She has worked on shadow reports discussing United States compliance with two important treaties, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. She has served as the co-chair of the CERD Task Force on Human Rights uh, of the Human Rights, U.S. Human Rights Network. Then there's Wilfred Codgerton, Professor Wilfred Codgerton, who is a constitutional law scholar with a focus on, focus on constitutional reform, electoral election law, and voting rights. He was pre previously the Bernard and, and his Spitzer Fellow and Counsel at Brenham Center for Justice at the NYU Law School where he focused on voting, election, election security, constitutional reform, and the rule of law. He is the author of the forthcoming book, The People's Constitution, 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union, which examines the constitutional amendments and the tension between the overall progressive arc of constitutional change and the conservative grip on the broader conversations around the constitution. And then finally, uh, our final panelist is Professor Sonia Jarvis, who is an attorney and a scholar whose research and teaching has focused, have focused on race, politics, and the media. As a practicing attorney, her practice, she practices around civil rights, civil liberties, and counseling nonprofit organizations and minority businesses. Business. Professor Jarvis has written several books, chap books, book chapters, and papers, and is currently co-authoring a book entitled "States of Confusion: How New Voter ID Requirements um, uh, Fall Down, Fail Democracy, and What Do or What to Do About It." She has also served as then administrative positions, including most notable as the executive di director of the National Coalition on Black Voter Participation. I would like to thank the panelists really very much um, for participating in the program this evening. 
and turned over immediately to Nense. Thank you again, Nense. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, as I mentioned, or as it was mentioned before, uh, I am Anse Ufat, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the New Georgia Project and our advocacy arm, the New Georgia Project Action Fund. We're probably best known for our large scale voter registration work. Um, to date, we've helped almost half a million Black, uh, Latinx, and AAPI and young Georgians register to vote in all 159 of Georgia's counties. Um, and so how we come to know about uh, sort of identifying and combating voter suppression um, is the honest way, quite frankly, um, in the year that we launched, um, we registered 86,419 people to vote. And by Georgia's voter registration deadline, only 46,000 of the people that we had registered to vote, and this was back in 2014, <clears throat> Only 46,000 of the folks that, of the 86,000 that we had registered to vote has shown up on the voter rolls. And so we approached the Secretary of State and said, hey, where are all these Black folks that we have registered to vote and why aren't they showing up on the voter rolls? Um, the response was to um, immediately subpoena all of our donor records, all of our emails, all of our communications between um, me, the executive director, and our founder, um, minority leader at the time, uh, Stacey Abrams. Um, and we were super clear that it was designed to have a chilling effect on um, you know, us and the community organizations and the partners and the people that were working with us to do this work. Uh, we sued in court, uh, filed what is known as a mandamus action. Um, it was a new cause of action to me, but the idea is that, hey, government official, you have a job, you have a mandate and you are not doing it. And so we needed to sue in the um, in state court uh, in order to compel them to do their jobs. We actually lost and um, it was one of the few cases that we lost in court and what we were told is that yes, the voter registration deadline has already passed, but the election is not here yet. And so it is possible that the 40,000 people that you are looking for may eventually make it on the voter rolls between now and the election day. Um, I, you're smart people, you can imagine that that most certainly did not happen. That in fact, of the 40,000 people that we had registered uh, in time to vote in the November 2014 um, gubernatorial elections. Um, it took nine months uh, for the bulk of those folks to make it onto the voter rolls. And so we started to dig, um, we started to investigate. And what I now know is that the scope the scale, the size, the geographic diversity of our voter registration efforts have helped us to expose um, many of the deficiencies that uh, are in Georgia's electoral infrastructure. And quite frankly, work rules that um, work together to suppress votes um, that were not actually the law of the land. They were not statutes. Um, we have what is known as exact match in the state. Um, if that the information that's on your voter registration form does not exactly and 100% match what is contained in the state's um, uh, DMV database, the driver's database, or in the Social Security Administration's database, um, then you are kept from um, the voter rolls. The problem is that the Social Security Administration says, don't use our information in that way. It is unreliable, or not unreliable, but there, it, there are errors, and the right to vote is too important um, for you to be relying on this one source as a way to disprove someone's identity. And, uh, you know, what we've learned is that because of exact match, uh, Black Georgians are eight times more likely 
likely to be purged from the voter rolls. Uh, Latinx Georgians and AAPI Georgians are six times more likely to be purged from the voter rolls as are um, women and femmes and people who change their name. So if you've ever had to change your name, you understand that you know, there's the driver's license, there's insurance, there's banking information, etc. And oftentimes, um, uh, changing your voter registration um, is not at the top of mind. Um, and so what I'll say is that Georgia has a long and a recent history of voter suppression. Um, I think that, you know, adding 500,000 black and brown folks to the voter rolls has made Georgia um, I mean, there's general consensus now that Georgia is America's newest swing state. Um, and so what that has meant is the, the decisions uh, about electoral outcomes um, in, a, in large part will be decided by one, who shows up and two, whose votes get counted. Um, and because Georgia is the state with the largest share of black voters, um, the history of suppressing black votes in a place like Georgia is directly tied to the, uh, the partisan makeup um, that we see in the state. Georgia also um, until recently had the dishonor of being the state with the least competitive state legislature. So 80% of incumbents in Georgia state legislature ran unopposed. And so be they Democrats or Republicans, questions and concerns about, you know, why 75% of Georgians support uh, Medicaid expansion, but we still don't have it in the state of Georgia. Um, questions that, you know, an overwhelming majority of Georgians support a 15 $15 minimum wage, but the minimum wage in Georgia is $5.15 an hour. It's below the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. And they are not embarrassed because they are not accountable. They're not accountable because instead of citizens and voters choosing our elected officials, they are able to shrink the electorate and shrink who is able to participate in our elections. Um, what I will say is that the thing that we have learned in this moment is um, we would get tons of advice, tons of feedback saying that the best practices were to never talk about voter suppression, that we shouldn't talk about it because um, research shows that it has a demoralizing um, and a dampening impact on turnout. Um, and that never sat well to me, um, you know, to paraphrase, uh, you know, uh, Amilcar Cabral, we're never going to lie to the people, um, but we don't we don't do this work so that people cannot participate in the elections. We don't register 500,000 people to vote, particularly people of color, so they can decide that their vote doesn't matter and that the system is rigged. And so it is very important to us that um, as we work to register people, that we also work to change the culture of elections and change the culture of how we participate and how we make decisions collectively. And so, um, you know, again, while we're best known for our large scale voter registration efforts, we lean heavily into culture and cultural organizing as a way to change not only the narrative, but again, how people engage with um, the electoral process. And so what that looks like is, and um, I, I'll give an example about quarantine. Um, uh, you know, we had a goal of registering an additional 100,000 people to vote this year. Um, that was not able to happen because we aren't going to music festivals. We aren't going to move in days on college campuses. Um, and so on National Voter Registration Day, we partnered with EA Sports um, to 
uh, live stream video game play with the most popular and the most successful professional video game players in the country, um, Black and Latinx video game players in the country. We uh, focused on and lean into our relationships with um, Gen Zers and millennials, highlighting the fact that they are the largest voting bloc in our country now, and they literally have the opportunity to save the Republic um, and, you know, change the course that our democracy is moving in. Um, we registered 9,000 young people in one day. And so it is clear to us that at least in this particular moment that we're in, that folks understand um, how important vote registering to vote is, but that we position voter registration and electoral um, um, participation as a way to counter um, all of the negative um, that we see, all of the voter suppression taxes that we see while we wait to get secretaries of state and quite frankly, governors who see it as their responsibility to make it easier for Georgians to vote. The way that we see ourselves combating um, and neutralizing voter suppression um, is to have overwhelming participation in our elections. And um, I have about a minute left, so I'm gonna focus on really quickly, some of the key findings of our research that has led to overwhelming historic participation in Georgia's June 9th primaries, despite a more aggressive Secretary of State as it relates to voter suppression. And that is leading us in the first, you know, week and a half of early voting to see historic numbers day after day after day. So to the things that we know, one, cynicism and frustration that Black voters feel like their voices do not count um, and won't make a difference in their lives. Um, they maintain a justifiable cynicism towards elected officials and political organizations, even Black ones like ours, um, because there is a perception that they pose a barrier to political communications. Um, but two, power and optimism, like both of those things can be true. Both of those things can absolutely reflect the mood and the sentiment of voters of color and specifically black voters. Black voters feel, feel very optimistic about this election. Um, voters over 50 believe that their vote is extremely powerful. We've seen that the floor is 80% of black voters over 50 uh, feel like their vote is extremely powerful. Voters under 50, that floor drops to about 51%. But the idea is that the diversity, the sustainability, and the progress of recent protest has produced an optimism in Black voters that's a real messaging opportunity, that this is real. I get a lot of questions about, you know, when we're out um, at demonstrations, particularly during this summer, sort of racial justice uprisings, whether or not protesters are gonna show up to the polls. And part of me feels like that question is not necessarily asked in good faith, but what I'm happy to show is that again, we have seen historic levels of participation. Um, and it's not because of enthusiasm for a particular candidate. It's because there's a growing recognition that um, one, voting is a powerful and important tool and we aren't going to take it off of the table. And so um, two, that we are in the middle of a pandemic and that in a place like Georgia, 80% of the people who've been hospitalized due to COVID are people of color, black and brown Georgians. 50% of the people who have died due to COVID in Georgia are black and brown. Georgia was the first state uh, in the country to open early. Um, and and, and for any people, like Atlanta is open, open. Um, so while many people, many of us are still quarantining, um, that is not the case, which is why coronavirus cases are on the rise, et cetera. And so I, I, I say all that to say that um, the, that the, which brings me to my third point is that people are voting on issues. And so while there may not be enthusiasm that we've seen for individual candidates, right? Um, so comparing, for example, Black voters' enthusiasm for Obama versus Black voters' enthusiasm for Trump or um, Biden, that 
that is not what is contributing to this surge in participation is that people understand um, coronavirus is a real threat, that racism and discrimination are issues, and that the economy and jobs, these are the top three issues for all Black Georgians, men and women over and under 50, first generation, multiple generations. Um, and then lastly, um, one of the things, one of the tactics that's been really helpful in this moment um, because of COVID, because of coronavirus, virus uh, is vote by mail. Um, and while we work, so one of the tools of voter suppression um, is misinformation and disinformation, particularly targeted at Black voters and young voters and those who are sort of new and unfamiliar to the process, for example, naturalized citizens. Um, and so we are doing what, you know, what we call social listening. Um, it's a new sort of tactic that we have adopted within our organization using digital organizers who help us monitor conversations on social media, specifically for disinformation around voting, um, around vote by mail, um, around COVID, coronavirus, et cetera. And so this moment, um, I, what, I've, what, I have, I've, what I've said before is that, um, you know, that the tactics around voter suppression or the, the, yeah, the voter suppression tactics that we see in this day um, are not just Bubba on the back of a pickup truck with a shotgun trying to intimidate Black voters, um, that it has become much more sophisticated. And so those of us are practitioners and those of us who sort of do this work and do the work of civic engagement are required to become more sophisticated in our response in this moment. And I will stop there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marcia Johnson Blanco and I co-direct the Voting Rights Project to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And in my role as the um, co-director of the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee, um, I oversee the work that we do with partners within the Election Protection Nonpartisan Voter Protection Coalition. And I wanted to talk a bit today about the impact of um, the restrictions that we're seeing. Um, on the work that partners such as um, in state of new um, georgia project and the voters that they help and to ground that a bit in the voting rights act of 1965. Uh, the voting rights act of 1965 was passed 95 years after the passage of the 15th amendment and as professor bogues noted that the um, right to vote um, in the US has been, um, I would say, begrudgingly given over time. Um, we saw the opening, and we generally saw the opening of the franchise during, after cataclysmic events. So after the Civil War, we had the passage of what uh, we call the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to um, formerly enslaved men. And then we had the um, 19th Amendment that passed after um, World War I that gave the right to vote to women. However, um, that, those rights were not um, really given to Black and other racial minorities, African American and other racial minorities. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that really opened up the franchise. And I like to say that basically that's when democracy really began in the United States is 1965. And so we are very much a very young democracy. And what we um, are witnessing, you know, within with voter suppression today can really be tied to the backlash we've seen um, throughout history when um, rights are given and how those rights would be implemented. So we saw after the 15th Amendment um, was passed in 1870, there were grandfather clauses, um, poll taxes, um, having to vouch for voters, uh, tests um, that had to be literacy tests in order for African-Americans to get the right to vote. 
And the Voting Rights Act essentially sought to, um, you know, 95 years later, as I said, um, sought to push back, to stop that pushback against the expansion of the right to vote. And one very important provision in that pushback was Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And Section 5 really required jurisdictions with a history of discrimination in voting to submit their voting changes for federal review before they could be implemented. Unfortunately, after the uh, reauthorization in 2005 of the key provisions of the Voting Rights Act, including Section 5, the Supreme Court has essentially weakened the Voting Rights Act um, in 2013 with the Shelby County decision, which did not attack Section 5, which is what um, those um, who brought the um, litigation tried to undermine as unconstitutional, but rather what the court said was that the formula that determined which jurisdictions were subject to Section 5 um, would be unconstitutional, was, it was unconstitutional, and so therefore, there is no one to apply Section 5 to. And I wanted to give a, you know, a really quick example of what that has meant, what that meant at the time and what it means today in terms of um, voter suppression. So in uh, 2012, Texas passed a really restrictive voter ID law, um, a law that really targeted which um, types of ID could be used to vote. And very tellingly, um, did not include student identification, but included concealed gun carry permit. And it really narrowed, you know, the, the types of ID that could be used to vote um, such that when Texas went to, um, some, when the Texas on the, in 2012, when there was still the Section 5 regime being implemented, uh, went to the, the U.S. Department of Justice and submitted the, their ID law, DOJ objected and told Texas, you can't implement this, it's discriminatory. Texas then went, as, it was, uh, that, as is allowed on the Voting Rights Act, to the district court in the District of Columbia. And once again, the court said, this is discriminatory um, not to be implemented. When the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, ruled on the Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013 and struck down the formula that um, under which Section 5 was applied, Texas immediately, same day, implemented and put into um, interaction that voter ID law that had been found to be discriminatory. And it really highlighted what um, the dissent that the late great Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg gave in the Shelby County decision when she said that taking away the Section 5, taking away the preclearance um, provision of the Voting Rights Act when it was working to stop discrimination and um, continue, when it did stop and continue to stop discrimination in voting was like taking away an umbrella in a rainstorm because you weren't getting wet. And when the Supreme Court took away the Section 5 provision, um, the ability to use Section 5 um, in the Voting Rights Act, Texas, um, it was essentially taking away that umbrella from voters in Texas. And so Texas implemented a voter ID law, which in subsequent litigation were able to show affected 600,000 registered voters in Texas. And it took seven years of litigation for us to get an ID law that would um, to strike down that restrictive ID law and get an ID law in, in, in place that would ensure that um, all voters in Texas would have an opportunity um, to cast their ballot. And so it's in, in this new um, regime without these full protections of the Voting Rights Act, that we saw instances like um, what NSA talked about with the exact match in Georgia. We saw polling place consolidations. We've seen um, the uh, voters' um, laws being passed without notice to communities. And so um, polling place relocations and 
those types of acts would have would have required review by um, the, the DOJ or the federal court before they could be implemented. And um, coupled with the Voting Rights Act, we also have the National Voter Registration Act, which I also want to bring up because this is a law that we most people know it as motor voter when you go to get your driver's license that um, you can you're offered the opportunity to register to vote and the um the national voter registration act has a provision a list maintenance provision which allows states to uh basically update the list when people die or they've moved but this provision is often used to what we call purge voters from the voter rolls. So NSA talked about the challenges to get voters on the voter rolls. And then we have um, on the other end, people who either challenge the eligibility of voters or jurisdictions that purge voters from the voter rolls um, without following the, pr the procedures required under the National Voter Registration Act. And so the Supreme Court um, in um, Husted versus APRI gave this very narrow ruling of the list maintenance of what um, states are required to do or how they're required to start list maintenance under the National Voter Registration Act by saying, so first I should say the National Voter Registration Act says that you can't remove someone from the voter rolls for failure to vote. And then it gives these very specific uh, instructions under which you can remove voters from the voter rolls. Um, you have to send them um, notification to confirm um, their registration. And if you haven't heard back from them after two federal elections, then you can um, remove them from the voter rolls. There was Ohio, which was removing, um, started the process of removing voters from the voting rolls um, for failure to vote. And this in contradiction of the clear language of the National Voter Registration Act. But the Supreme Court in Houston versus APRI said, well, you know, Ohio is not really removing voters from the voting rolls for failure to vote. It is merely beginning the process of removing voters um, from the voting rolls for failure to vote. And and allowed Ohio to continue um, to continue this process. And that was just one example of really aggressive voter purging that um, jurisdictions were engaged in. And so we have um, this environment with a weakened Voting Rights Act. We have uh, extensive um, and aggressive voter purges that were also, um, it's, it wasn't, it's not just election officials that were initiating these um, voter purges, but other organizations that were writing to um, counties and saying, we um, are insisting that you remove, um, you know, this num these identified voters from your voter rolls and counties doing it without even following the requirements under the um, National Voter Registration Act, as I mentioned. And so we have this environment of laws that are on the books that are being really read very narrowly or very weakened as um, we are having um, voters, you know, and, and organizations that, such as NSAIDs who are trying to really encourage voters to participate um, in the voting process. And while this is all going on, we are now up upon this un unprecedented moment we are in where we are now having to vote during a pandemic and relying on vote by mail, which um, many before um, the current um, voting season, really most voters know you go to the polls to vote. Now vote by mail is a new way of voting that um, voters, um, a new option that voters have but what we saw throughout the spring and the summer as we focused on our um, vote by mail laws is that they contain restrictions that make it harder for some voters to be able to vote. You know, there are states that require you to have an excuse in order to be able to vote you uh, in order to be able to vote by mail. And then um, the challenges to um, those restrictions, such as in Texas, where we said, 
this needs to be opened up because there's a pandemic and going to um, the polls is not an option for all voters. And unfortunately, the court said, no, Texas can keep its restrictive um, requirements on vote by mail. Um, we saw, we see jurisdictions that have witness requirements. Again, when you have um, a pandemic and we need to socially distance, having to go to, a, to find a witness or in some cases where you have to have the um, ballot notarized um, becomes a barrier to the vote. We've also seen um, limitations on um, where um, voters can drop off um, their ballots. And so I, I, I'm saying this just to talk about voter suppression, all not um, being just uh, keeping certain people from being able to vote, but also on the limitations of the implementation of the right to vote. When you institute uh, provisions that make it harder for some voters than others to be able to vote, then you are really choosing which um, types of voters um, have opportunities and which don't. You know, going back to um, the Texas voter ID law that I mentioned, uh, a lot of times people say, what's the big deal? You know, you need ID for other um, activities. Why not um, needing an ID for, uh, in order to vote? And, you know, first, you know, I always say, well, voting is a fundamental right and you shouldn't have to, um, in, this, in essence, put a barrier up against that fundamental right. And what I mean is, um, going back to the Texas example, is that in order to get the ID that folks needed in order to be able to vote, they had to show a certified copy of the birth certificate. And in order to get a certified copy of the birth certificate, you had to pay for that certified copy of the birth certificate. So it's a, you know, a poll tax by degrees in order um, to be able to vote. And we had this very strong witness in our Texas ID case, which who essentially said, you know, I had to choose between my kitchen and, and the vote because she didn't have the money to pay to get the um, certified copy of her uh, birth certificate in order to get the ID in order to be able to vote. So when we look at laws that are seemingly neutral on their face, we really need to look at how they're being implemented and who um, and the impact um, of certain uh, on voters. Um, one other thing to mention with um, now that we're moving mainly to um, vote by mail is that We've seen from the primaries that there are a significant number of uh, ballots that are being rejected um, because of signature match. Um, and we're jurisdictions that are saying that um, the signatures on the vote by mail ballot do not match the um, either your ID signature or your voter registration signature. And we found that this has been disproportionately applied against minority voters. And in fact, in Gwinnett County, Georgia in 2018, we brought um, litigation to address that disproportionate rejection um, of vote by mail. And so as we look at, you know, how, who can vote and, and the means in which they, they can vote, is we really need to focus on the implementation of laws on the books and, and really look at who um, they have an impact on. And um, before I wrap up, I just really want to mention that, you know, Inse was talking about the Georgia legislature and the lack of accountability to voters. Really, you know, we, are, we just finished the official count of the 2020 census that was cut short by the courts. And as, you know, after that um, count is certified and sent um, to the president, we're going to start the redistricting process in 2020. 2021. And that is another process in which we need to really um, ensure that there's uh, citizenship, citizen engagement in that process to address how our, bound, how our voting boundaries are drawn, because it really does have an impact on the weight of the vote uh, and, and the, the means that um, voters have to ensure that they're lawmakers that, affect, uh, that address the policies that they care about. And so uh, I will stop there for now. Um, look forward to the questions.
Uh, great. Thank you very, very much for that detailed presentation. Wilfred? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Wilfred Codrington. I'm an assistant professor of law at Brooklyn Law School and a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, and I want to thank the audience. Um, whoever you are, wherever you are, you never really know these days. Um, and to my co-panelists for the roles that you are uh, playing, the critically important roles for uh, making democracy work in this really exceptionally difficult time. Um, to you, Professor Bogues, and the staff at the CSSJ uh, for your dedication to racial and social justice and having series like these, this this is an America series that's so important to um, you know the the commitment you have shown to to making uh, our country a better place uh, and. One of the reasons why I love Brown, um, just to note this year, 2020, we were supposed to celebrate my 15 year anniversary, my, my 15 year reunion. Um, so I am very happy to be here as present as I can be in this world. Um, so I'd love for you to humor me for a moment, um, to follow me in a thought experiment, um, a thought experiment to try to bring together and put in perspective some of the things that the uh, co-panelists and uh, have talked about already and what we'll be discussing. Um, we can call it the life of American democracy in a day. So we'll think about a few points in US political and legal history and where key decisions were made regarding American political participation and the allocation of power. Um, and we'll think about it as if it occurred in a single day. So. 230 years condensed into a period of 24 hours. So at the strike of midnight, the US Constitution goes into effect. Um, at the strike of midnight, we have in place the Electoral College and the Three Fifths Clause, thus enhancing the power of Southern slaveholders and the federal government by incentivizing them to uh, grow slavery as an institution. It gives them additional clout in the Congress due to the slave bonus. Uh, it gives them a grip on power. Uh, 10 of the 12 first 12 presidents and the Supreme Court. And so they have this outsized influence over the important legal and policy making institutions. At the strike of midnight, we have in place a structure that affords states the power, great authority to conduct their elections as they see fit. And so those states at the strike of midnight choose to exclude most everyone from the political community besides property owning white men. And at the strike of midnight, we have thus violated so many of the self evident truths set forth in the Declaration of Independence, not just that all men are created equal or that they are endowed with certain unalienable rights, uh, including life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness but also that governments derive their power from the consent of the governed. And the clock keeps ticking and your alarm chimes around 7.45 AM. Uh, perhaps you slept in those hours and you got a good night's rest. Um, yet as you slept, slaves were toiling. They were laboring all night without pay, without thanks, without acknowledgement of their humanity. And as if you were in a game of Sim City, you woke up to a robust economy, uh, buildings erected, plantations sown and harvested, backbreaking work of all sorts had been done. And at 8 a.m., you stretch and you put on your slippers and you look out the window to see the aftermath of the Civil War. The president has been assassinated. The 13th Amendment has been ratified, thus abolishing slavery. And within a half hour, the 15th Amendment will, at least on parchment, bar racial discrimination in voting. Emphasis on, on parchment. So full one third of the day has already come and gone. Much occurs during the rest of your morning and around noon, you have a nice lunch and you decide to take a walk afterwards, work off some of those calories. And upon your return, Around 1.45, you see a note. Uh, the woman that made your lunch says she's gone out herself. She has left because the 19th Amendment has been ratified and she's gone to vote. 
you always sense she was one of those uppity women participating in those parades and the shenanigans staged in front of the White House. Um, but all that time of agi agitation finally paid off, at least for that particular woman, because she happened to be a white woman. Uh, the rest of the women, the other women, they'll have to wait their turn. And yet it's, it's still progress. More than half of the day has passed and we witness what is and what will be the single largest act to expand the franchise in American history. So much accomplished and it's only 2 p.m. After hours of frolicking about, you notice the sun's about to set. So you skip home and you wash your hands thoroughly and you sit down to dinner. You see it's about 6.20 p.m. and you turn on the CBS News and Walter Cronkite informs you that the nation's highest court just proclaimed that one person, one vote is the law of the land. Gone are all of those distortions and state legislative schemes that have afforded, afforded rural votes, mostly white votes, two, three, eight times the power of votes cast in the nation's more diverse cities. And Walter Cronkite, he's talking a mile a minute, and he says that the Voting Rights Act has been signed into law. And for a minute, you can't believe it. But this news is coming from Walter Conkright, the, the mouth of the most trusted man in America. And so as you take a bite of your pork chop, you think of the enormity of that announcement. The power of the federal government will be invoked at long last to enforce the guarantees of the 14th and the 15th Amendment. That prospect of a second founding lane some 10 hours earlier may actually become something. The federal government will start sweeping away poll taxes and literacy tests. It will permit monitoring of states and jurisdictions that have proven themselves to be perennial violators of the Constitution. Some of those places will even be required to seek preclearance for changes to their voting laws. So now the onus is on them and not on the Americans that they disenfranchise to prove that the changes in their laws are actually legitimate and that they would not be manipulating the law to either deny or abridge the right to vote on account of race. Three quarters of the day is gone. And with the president and the Congress and the court finally working alignment towards the cause of justice and inclusion, you think America might actually be able to call itself a democracy. And it's getting late. It's about 10 PM and you're getting ready to call it a night but your Amazon Alexa is peppering you with breaking news. There is an electoral college fail followed by a torrent of litigation and the Supreme Court decides the Bush v. Gore case, thus awarding the presidency to the loser of the national popular vote. Within minutes, that president proceeds to choose two more lifetime justices, including one to replace the moderate jurist with a staunch conservative. At about 1045, after a massive recession, the nation elects a black man. Congratulations, America, you are now post-racial. Or at least that's the subtext of the court's decision in Shelby County, uh, the decision that guts the Voting Rights Act, passed not so much earlier this evening. Now, without the protection of the nation's most successful civil rights law, a flurry of restrictive voting laws go into effect some, as one judge said, target black voters with almost surgical precision. Around 1.30 p.m., during the term of that black president, another seat, Supreme Court seat becomes vacant. But the substantially underrepresented Senate blocks his nomination. Minutes later, after what one late scholar calls uh, a white lash or white grievance at the ballot box, the country elects the vilest and most bigoted person to hold that office, at least in the last 12 hours. Well, not the country this time, the Electoral College. He fills that seat that remained open. And after another relatively moderate jurist retires, that president who represents a minority of the country and that Senate, which represents an even smaller minority of the country, they fill the seat with another staunch conservative. 
and it's minutes before midnight, and the court decides another landmark case and says that extreme uh, gerrymandering is okay, partisan gerrymandering. So if states can now affect that prohibited racial discrimination, they can do so if they say that it was motivated by party. You're really ready for bed now, but Alexa is now blaring about a global pandemic that hits just seconds before midnight. So you have to stay inside, but also an election is underway, so you should probably vote. And the health crisis lingers and the Supreme Court begins to block an array of measures intended to make it easier to vote. For some, just to make it possible to vote during a global pandemic. And the liberal justice on the court suddenly dies, opening yet another seat on the Supreme Court. And that minority president vows to fill it with someone who will lock in a conservative majority for decades to come. And that minority Senate proceeds to confirm that pick. In the words of Childish Gambino, this is America. Now, that's the end of my thought experiment. And my remarks generally, just to say that this does not have to be a story of doom and gloom. Know that this year we celebrated 150 years since the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which barred racial discrimination in voting. We celebrated 100 years since the 19th Amendment was ratified, which outlawed sex discrimination in voting. And we celebrated 55 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which actually began the work of reducing the pervasive racial discrimination that plagued voting in America. These were such profound manifestations of democracy wrought amidst the blood, sweat, and tears of people who knew subjugation and sacrifice to an extent that we can never know. And still, as far as they have taken us, we have a lot of unfinished work to do if we are to ever achieve that more perfect union for which they strove. And I know if you're like me, your head is now spinning and you want the day to end so you can just get some sleep, but if we are to really realize those promises, to actualize those promises of inclusion and equality and democracy, now is not the time for sleep. Now is the time, in the words of Childish Gambino, to stay woke. Thank you. Great. Oh, thank you very much, Wilfred. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the only uh, disadvantage of coming after the wonderful speakers you've heard from so far is they talked about a lot of the issues I was going to share with you. And so instead, uh, and I especially love the thought experiment we just went through, I think what I'll do is focus on some of the high points each of them raised in their discussion as a way for us to understand why this election is so important. For starters, we can look at this arc of history and how long it's taken for us to get to a point where uh, we're at one of the most important elections we've had, some say, since the Civil War. Um, we can also consider uh, how it required activism and hard work to change that original agreement that gave us a system that only allowed white men to vote initially. Over time that changed, but it took the Civil War for us to have meaningful change. So for example, we know that prior to the Civil War, there were only six states that even allowed black men to vote. Black women, of course, couldn't vote at all, along with all other women, until the 19th Amendment. We also know that the efforts to keep those of African descent from participating in the political process were actually redoubled after the Civil War and the adoption of the 15th Amendment, allowing Black men to vote, by virtue of various administrative techniques. And this is building on uh, Marsha's point about how we have to pay attention to what um, local officials, uh, how they implement uh, the rules concerning registration and voting. And as a result, uh, there was the grandfather clause that said 
If your grandfather voted, you could vote. But of course, if your grandfather was enslaved, he wasn't able to vote, and that prevented you from voting. Uh, there was a lawsuit in Oklahoma that overcame that. So next, we would look at, well, maybe you got past the grandfather clause, but now we're going to give you a literacy test. This, for people who had been, by law, prohibited from learning how to read. Um, and the test was to interpret, say, the Mississippi Constitution. Uh, absurd on its face, but that stayed in place up until the mid-60s. Uh, we also had um, the white primary that basically said you can vote in an election, but only, this came from North Carolina, but only if you had participated in the primary. And by the rules of the parties, uh, those who were um, not able to vote in the primary were those who were African American. So we see this series, and that wasn't overturned until 1944. So we see this series of actions from the adoption of the 15th Amendment all the way up until almost the end of World War II, where groups like the NACP and later uh, groups like the Lawyers Committee and other um, important civil rights groups had to fight these cases one by one until we finally got to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which of course followed the Civil Rights Act. But again, I don't want to minimize and act like these things were easy to do. Um, no, they involved great sacrifice. They involved people being um, fired from their jobs, beaten, lynched, and the rest, so that we could walk into a voting place, cast a ballot, and feel comfortable that that ballot was going to be counted. But this is to follow up on Insay's point and, and also um, uh, Professor Bogue's um, overview for us. We can also look at any time significant progress has been made, it's followed by a hard pushback. And so there were a couple of cases right after uh, the Voting Rights Act was adopted that sought to make sure that we weren't able to recognize those gains. Um, one of those cases was uh, Marston versus Lewis out of Arizona, which this was in 1973, uh, upheld a 50-day uh, deadline for registration. Uh, we can follow that with Richardson versus Ramirez in 1974. And that case basically was challenging the disenfranchisement of, of persons in prison. And the Supreme Court said, no, nah, it's okay, because the 14th Amendment says you can restrict the right to vote if someone has been um, convicted of a crime. So we're left with the situation where those types of cases gave a green light to the Southern states who were now under the Voting Rights Act, and they started engaging in all kinds of actions to test whether or not the Voting Rights Act meant what it said, culminating in the 1980 case of City of Mobile versus Bolden. Now, I should explain that that was a case out of Alabama, and the court had ruled that um, in order to challenge an adverse action by a um, local government, you had to show intentional discrimination. In other, in other words, someone would have to use the N-word to say, this is why we're doing this action, that type of degree of intentionality. And um, that was going to severely cripple um, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, fortunately, the Senate came through and passed an amendment to overcome that case um, and further um, reapproved of the Voting Rights Act. So we dodged that bullet in 1980, but we weren't able to dodge a similar bullet with the Shelby case in 2013. And I would also argue that there were people, especially on the conservative side of our, our nation, who have spent that time from 1980 to present 
uh, trying to restrict the right to vote again. Um, by first with Shelby, not ruling that the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional, but taking the most important section and gutting it during a time of high partisanship when we haven't even had a vote on that issue. And Congress could have overturned that particular decision, but we haven't even had a, a piece of legislation come up that would allow a vote to be taken. During this time, we're now facing the prospect of a hyper, um, I shouldn't say hyper, uh, but a, a majority of conservative uh, justices that will make it very difficult to have even split decisions going the other way, in part because of the actions taken by the Senate um, to block President Obama's choice to the court and the uh, hypocrisy we've seen demonstrated with respect to the current um, uh, candidate for the court that, that will be voted on next week. So the question for our purposes of talking about voter suppression and what can we do, we know, for example, that because of the, the Houston case, that it's now possible for uh, states to engage in, in purging much sooner than they normally would. We also know that the voter ID has continued to be used in a very restrictive way. And let me also just mention that most Americans feel it's okay to show an ID. They just don't understand why only certain IDs are, are now accepted rather than a range of IDs to simply prove who you are. And against that backdrop, I would argue that maybe it's time for us as part of this election process that that's painful and we're not through yet by any means, the next two weeks are going to be incredibly tense on these points. But maybe it's time for us to think about how do we put in our Constitution, not by virtue of case law, but the fact that we feel that voting is a fundamental right that should not be a bridge, a positive right rather than a negative one as we've had to suffer through these last 230 years. And so it's how best can we seize the moment? We're seeing people putting their health at risk because of restrictions on vote by mail. Uh, it was a project I worked on at my school where we went around the country to the 10 states that had the most restrictive voter ID laws to see how people were managing. And of course, there is a, a problem for those who cannot afford to get the ID, the special ID that's required by that particular state. Uh, but as I said, folks weren't complaining about it. They just wondered, can't this be easier? Why do I have to go through such hoops? And, and I think that's a question for our panel. Why do we have to go through such hoops if the right to vote is in fact a fundamental right? At the same time, we're watching actions by different states, for example, in Dodge City, Kansas. There was one polling place in that city and those who were in the, the position to do so decided to move it outside of the town limits and make sure it was not close to any bus line because the number of Latino voters had grown so large, this was considered a good way to suppress their vote. That's just one example. I could give you 300 but we don't have time for that. I just wanted to put a pin in that as an example of treatment of our largest uh, minority group in just one state. So let's look at it over all of the 50 states. I applaud those states that have made vote by mail easy, but I, I am very concerned about the states that continue to require a witness or a notary before you can send in your absentee ballot. I also am concerned about uh, the type of things we've seen in Georgia that Ente mentioned earlier in terms of long lines because you don't have enough equipment on hand or the machines break down in the middle of, a, of an election cycle. I mean, these are things that are part of, of the administration of elections that was supposed to be um, cured by the Help America Vote Act that followed the 2000 election. And I would argue that it's, it has not improved because the funds have not been sent to the states. 
And now we have extra challenges such as foreign governments trying to interfere and, and disrupt um, online voting systems. So right now, voting by mail is one of the safest ways we can vote because at least there's a paper trail as opposed to electronic uh, voting booths where you might not have any trail at, at all, especially if it's been hacked. And a number of states were hacked in 2016, and now we're going to wait and see how many are going to be hacked in 2020, between now and Election Day. So one thing I want to leave uh, the group with is the question of how do we get to a point where we're in a position to talk seriously about enshrining the right to vote within our Constitution and not relying on laws that can be overturned on a whim by a court, and especially as we're expecting that court to become more conservative and more hostile to the rights of all Americans to participate in the process. I've been fortunate to, to work for a judge who was very much involved in the cases in the 60s that helped to uh, engage the Supreme Court in ruling against adverse actions that were taken against not just black voters, but American Indian voters and Asian American voters and um, uh, a range of tactics that to this day um, give us pause when we're trying to consider the best way forward. So I'll stop there so that we can uh, engage in some discussion with those of you who signed in today. Great. Uh, okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Professor Jarvis. <clears throat> um, I will have, I had a couple of questions, but I'm going to um, not ask those questions uh, since we only have about uh, 15 minutes more or so. Um, you know, after these really very important uh, contributions that all the panelists made, and just turn over, um, see what questions the audience had. Um, Catherine, have you? Can you? Do we have some questions we can pose to the panelists? Yeah, so this first question is for Ense, and it comes from Madeline in the audience. It's a two-part question, and it asks, do you track or have an understanding of what percent of voters you register turn out to vote? And if 80% of representatives in the state run unopposed, what incentive, incentive do citizens have to vote? We obsessively track uh, what percentage of our registrants turn out to vote. Um, the national average uh, for third party voter registration um, drives and groups is probably um, around 20%. And our baseline, our floor is about 55%. Um, that number is growing um, each day, I think, as we endeavor to build what we call super voters. Um, and these are folks who vote in every election in which they're eligible. And as we sort of raise awareness about low salience elections, so, you know, often like levies for school boards and special elections often don't fall on people's radars. And so we, um, we see it as our work to raise awareness and to raise the salience um, about uh, what's at stake at, at, in every election in our state. Um, and then what incentivizes people to vote if only 80% of the people are running unopposed. So that was a number from 2014 when we launched the New Georgia Project. That number has gone down significantly, um, so much to the point that we now have zero uh, people running unopposed in the 2020 state house elections. And so um, another you know, saying we have within the organization is there are no safe seats. Um, and so regardless of party, there are no safe seats. And so this represents not only a shift in culture in like our elections and how we talk about them, but it's had a real immeasurable and like visible impact on the culture of elections inside the legislature. Thanks for asking. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Catherine, we, do we have another one? Yeah, this next question question comes from Chris who asks, is there a national reporting tool for states to report on the delays and improprieties in voter registration so that the media and other orgs could keep a microscope on both the administrators and elected officials who suppress the vote? I think that's to anyone of the panelists. 
Yeah, I'm not aware yes. of one. Ms. Jarvis, uh, Jarvis, Professor Jarvis? Sure. Um, one possibility, um, and I agree with Marsha's uh, first thought, though, we do have the um, Election Assistance Commission that could be the repository of those kinds of reports. Uh, but typically what happens is they happen, the lines are long, and now people are scrambling to find an attorney to try and stop them from closing the doors when they normally would close. So it's a very good question, and it's part of that concern we've all expressed over um, election administration. So the Help America Vote Act was supposed to address questions like that. I would say it was weak and did not go far enough, but it's a place to start uh, uh, in answer to your question. Marsha, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, no, I, I think um, it's a good point that Professor Jarvis has brought up about the um, Election Assistance Commission. It's actually a great repository of data. Unfortunately, it's after the election. And so, but it, but it is helpful to um, use that as we look forward to being able to pass reforms whether it's on the federal or the um, state level. I mean, we've used the EAC data to bring litigation to uh, make sure that there is proper enforcement of the National Voter Registration Act. And, um, and I know that, um, I, and I should mention that another um, uh, responsibility of the EAC is the um, providing funds to states to um, update equipment and to um, train their uh, election officials. And so the EAC actually has a really great role to play. It's not funded as it should be. <laughs> and um, it can definitely um, have greater responsibilities, but it is a great starting point to address some of the issues that were raised. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, is there another one on the table? Yeah, Chris also asked, are there any state or federal funds available for voter registration or any interesting legislation? I can speak to the legislation. Mm -hmm. um, in the, there are bills that have been introduced in um, Congress to um, have nationwide online um, voter registration. There are um, also um, bills that have been introduced looking at um, automatic voter registration. So mm -hmm. what that means is that if you have any interaction with a governmental agency, um, they would um, register you to vote. So it's the idea along the lines of selective service, you know, you're male, you're 18, <laughs> you're signed up. And so if you're eligible, you meet all the eligibility requirements to register to vote, then, you know, you should be able to sign up and then there are questions about whether you can opt in, you should have to opt in or have to opt out. But those are some um, legislations, that, that's some legislation that has been um, proposed to just broaden opportunities on voter registration. Okay, um, if I could ask a question of all the panelists while we, while we gather in more questions. Um, this is supposed to be a democratic country. It's law, you know, I agree, it has been lauded like that all over the world. We, it's about the American idea and American as the beacon of democracy, the city on the hill and so on. But we have heard from all of you the real, um, real instances that are not just episodic, but real patterns of voter suppression. So I wanted to ask you separately, um, why do we have voter so much voter suppression in America? What is the, what's the political purpose of this? Wilfred? Yeah, I mean, in short, I would say a combination of power and fear. Um, power and what? I couldn't hear uh, you second. I'm sorry, I said power and fear. Uh, and I would say that uh, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement and these modes of disenfranchising and disempowering 
it really did begin from the start, right? We, we all discussed how um, at the convention, one, there was a decision to empower states to run elections. And part of that was very much so they can set the terms of who qualified as part of, um, part of the political community. Um, and um, it provided very little protection for those who needed the protection the most, obviously. Um, and so this has been like a power play um, which sort of enabled uh, the exclusion of certain people um, in various combinations of permutations that reigned, that was persistent, um, and that that was just perpetuated because people knew that if you expand an electorate, that makes your your possibility of re, re, retaining that power um, much harder, right? You're taking a bet on whether people think you're actually doing a good job. And I think, you know, what what this really amounts to in the end is, is power and fear. You you wanna you have that power, you wanna retain that power, you're afraid of losing that power. So you impose power plays to entrench yourself in power, right? Um, and um, I think that fear and that power, or that fear of that loss of power is uh, much more present now. Um, and, and it gets even more present with every day as the country diversifies and the set of people who are accustomed to having that power are seeing it threatened by a sort of a, a more multicultural democracy or the potential for a, a multicultural democracy. Then stay, would you care to answer that? Why voter suppression? Why voter suppression one? Sorry, I am putting out fires. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, I understand that. I was trying to ask a question about why voter suppression? Why in a country that is lauded and that projects itself as a, as a democratic country, um, and it, you know both uh, electoral democracy and democracy democracy generally, there is there is not just episodes, but there are pat this is a pattern of voter suppression. What it is, what is it that drives this these pattern this pattern? I think it's really important for us to resolve the gap between the rhetoric that America sort of uses to talk about itself and the reality of our democracy. There's always been a gap. You started us off, Professor Boggs, today talking mm -hmm. about the origins of the right to vote and that mm -hmm. you needed to be a property owning white dude in order to have the right to vote. Uh, Professor Codrington told us about, you know, if we put the US on a 24 hour clock it's we're super late in the day when people were even able to publicly acknowledge that race and gender should not be barriers to access to the franchise. And so why voter suppression? Because the work of sort of building this more perfect union has challenged a lot of our assumptions about who is a citizen and who is not. And as that definition continues to expand, it challenges, again, notions of, you know, again, democracy and citizenship and Americanness. Um, and so I also think that, so that's number one, is that there's a gap between the rhetoric of democracy and America and democratic participation and the reality. And so resolving it requires us to close that gap. And um, in the middle of that gap is sort of voter suppression as people work to maintain um, status quo, number one. Number two, I would say that in an economy of ideas that people, the majority of Americans are not buying what Republicans are selling. And in order for them to hang on to power, um, particularly in a place like Georgia, they have to cheat. Uh, that, you know, when you, when we started the New Georgia Project in 2014, the delta the, between the successful Republican and the losing Democrat was consistently between two and 300,000 votes. And that was over the course of a decade of more than a decade of elections. So two and 300,000 votes between a successful Republican and losing Democrat over multiple cycles. And then we started the work of the New Georgia Project, again, to expand the electorate to register in communities that were ignored and we look at the 2018 gubernatorial race in Georgia that in spite 
that 1.7 million people have been purged while our now governor was the secretary of state. We registered about 60,000 people in 2018 who they refused, people of color, who they refused to add to the voter rolls uh, in 2018. And then we had to sue. Um, tens of thousands of ballots were thrown out because of um, signature match. And the Delta got narrowed to 54,000 votes. So uh, leader Abrams lost to our current governor, Brian Kemp by 50,000 votes. So, and that is with, again, almost 2 million people being purged from the voter rolls, crazy long lines, 10 to 15% 15% of our um, polling locations closed or consolidated. So with all of they were still only able to win by a gap of 54,000 votes. No one is buying, or that's not true. The majority of new voters are not buying what they are selling. And the only way that they are able to maintain power, and particularly power in a place like Georgia, where in five years, Georgia's going to be the first state in the deep south with a white minority. So in five years, people of color are going to make up the plurality, like the majority. Um, that the only way that they can hold on to power, the only way, reason they have a Republican trifecta okay. is because of, of cheating and voter suppression. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm not going to ask the other two panelists because I want to take one more question and we have to go three more minutes. And my apologies to, the, to, uh, to both Marsha and Sonia. Um, Catherine, could you give the last question? And then I will ask uh, all the panelists to wrap up with those statements. Catherine? This last question comes from Anthony who asks, can any of you envision the passage of a constitutional amendment that would take the regulation of elections and districting out of the hands of states? And if so, what might that amendment look like? Great question. Yep. Well, I'll give you some language to think about. Um, this was first proposed by a uh, a uh, Democratic representative uh, named Mark Pocan, P-O-C-A-N, of Wisconsin, who proposed back around the Shelby case the following language. Section 1, every citizen of the United States who is of legal voting age shall have the fundamental right to vote in any public election held in the jurisdiction in which that citizen resides. Section two, Congress shall have the power to enforce and implement this article by appropriate legislation. Well, that's, that's a start, but it doesn't solve our electoral college bind. And until we deal with that, we're still going to be chasing our tails, I think. But I think it's a great question. And I think it's part of the kind of organizing and advocacy that has to go forward after we survive this current election. Great, thank you. Can I just ask all the panelists for a last, for their remarks, very brief last remarks. Let me start with Marsha and then just oh, work on Yeah, yeah um, Marcia. Yeah, um, yes, I right. should say that as NC noted, we have um, a rhetoric that needs to, or um, a narrative that is not met by reality, but over the history, the way that reality, that rhetoric, um, the, the narrative has become reality is through engagement by people. So I see a lot of promise with what happened this summer with people in the streets. And I think voting is an extension of that protest. And the only way we're gonna to get to recognize the America we want is if people really engage and vote this election and call the 866 hour vote number if they have any questions. Great, thank you very much, Marcia. Uh, Wilfred? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to echo what Marcia said. Um, you know, that the, the, in what the other panelists said, there is obviously a rhetorical gap here, um, but it is important. This is a very important election we have underway right now. More than 30 million people have already voted uh, one way or the other. It's important that you have a vote plan that you're going to be voting in, uh, in person, try to vote early. If you have to vote on election day, bring some coffee and other stuff because it may be some time, but it is very, very important. And it has shown in the numbers so far, 
so far we've seen about 20% or more than um, people have voted at this time last year. So um, we, we hope to see an increase in the numbers across the board and that increase and, and that sort of dedication and diligence is necessary to impact the change that all of the panelists have been talking about. Thank you very much, Wilfred. Can I ask Sonia? Uh, did you mean it say? Because I, I thought no, no. I was done. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, um, I, was giving, well, I was giving you for a last sound. Um... Oh, terrific. No, thank you. First of all, again, to all of the panelists, this has been a treat to hear your thoughts and ideas on how we continue the fight for the right to vote. Um, I think this is a watershed event with respect to this current election, but it can't stop once the election is over. Uh, as you heard just from Wilford, we've got to do more. We've got to continue to push that rock up the hill so that we can finally achieve what John Lewis and others before us have been uh, laying the path for us on a way forward. So right, thank you. Uh, very thank you very thank much. Thank you, Sonia. Let's end with you for the later from Georgia. <laughs> um, I'll be brief. I will say that uh, I tend to uh, subscribe to the gospel choir theory of organizing, the idea being that they are able to hold beautiful notes for a really long time because people are doing their part, right? That when an individual vocalist needs to drop out, the note will continue. And so that is the approach that we take to organizing. I think that's the approach that we take to um, maintaining our democracy. And so I encourage all of you to identify and find your political home. Um, and I think it's really important so that people who share your values and care about the things that you do, um, because that is, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, we are able to build about, build the sort of cities, the countries, the communities that we want to live in. Um, and so that you have some people to celebrate with on election day. Great. Thank you all very, very much for a really robust, stimulating, and very important panel. Thank you, Catherine, for doing the questions. Um, have a good evening, all of you, and remember to vote, please. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.